a year of progress for the Indiana fever, and Lyndon is here to talk all about it. Locked on women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi there, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Megda. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. More than 100,000 of you showed up for us again last month. We are on track to break that number and have our biggest month yet here at Locked On Women's Basketball. So thank you for showing up for us like we show up for you. It is, of course, not just me. It is the entire staff. Over at The Next, thenexthoops.com, where we have 24-7, 365 coverage of women's basketball. We have a beat reporter on every WNBA team that is not only the eight in the playoffs, but the four who have plans to join the playoffs next year. And to talk about that, about that progress, and about a team that, to my mind, I'm going to throw this question uh, to you, Lyndon general manager of the Indiana Fever, by the end of the season, it struck me, it seemed to me that you had one of the eight best teams. Obviously, playoffs aren't made that way, but I wonder if you saw it that way, given the progression that your team had made. Uh, Howard, I did. And after watching the two games last night uh, with uh, Minnesota and Chicago, I, I really felt like I was reinforced again um, that we, we are one of the top eight teams um, and that we made the progress that we needed to. We had some bumps in the road with injuries. Uh, I'm still convinced uh, had uh, Melissa Smith been healthy uh, that part of the season where she was out, uh, that we could have very easily been uh, in, in, in the place of, of one of those two as a seventh or eighth seed uh, uh, in the playoffs because of the progress that we made. But we didn't get in, so it's an exciting time knowing that we can build on what we did do, go from five wins to uh, to 13 wins, add eight more wins uh, with a very young, talented team. It's interesting to me. You go by net rating, for instance, over the final 10 games of the year, you guys were eighth. Uh, if you go by offensive rating alone, you guys are sixth. So, you know, for the listeners at home, this isn't just uh, a question of seeing some late victories. You know, the underlying data – really indicates it. And, and of course, Melissa Smith, such a big part of both what you guys were this year and also what you guys are going forward. So throughout segment one, we're going to talk about, you know, when you came back here, it was a three-year plan. We are after year two. There's evident progress. We're going to talk about what year two was, segment two, a little bit more about what's left to do, uh, especially in off-season ahead with a fair amount of uncertainty, even by traditional off-season standards, given, you know, the COVID year and so many players who have a lot to figure out. But let's start with that progress. And, you know, top of the list, of course, is Aaliyah Boston, somebody who leads the lead in field goal percentage as a rookie. Uh, we know Don Staley talked for years about you just get Aaliyah Boston into the WNBA where she's not triple teamed at all times and the efficiency goes up. But you got bigger players. You've got, uh, you know, pro bodies, people who have been in the weight room for years. How how incredible, even by that standard, is what Aaliyah Boston did from an efficiency perspective as a rookie to you? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's it's never happened before. I, we've never had a, a rookie, a first-round draft pick, uh, lead, the, lead the league in field goal shooting percentage. It's, it's never happened. And so that's an indication to you of what an amazing season um, Aaliyah Boston had. I mean, we knew she'd be good. I mean, we'd watched her at South Carolina. I've watched her in USA National Team trials, and um, we've met with her. We knew what kind of character she had, and so we knew she was going to be good, but we had no idea how good, how composed, how much po uh, poise she would have when she did start getting double teamed. And, and what a... Um, uh, she makes her teammates better. You know, a, a lot of players have that ability, uh, but not often as a rookie. And so there were just so many things that were exceptional about her. And, and, and I, it just reinforces 
um, you, you know, what a great player we've got to build around for the future. Um, and, and she's just as phenomenal off the court in the community with fans, uh, with her teammates. Um, you know, she, she really is the whole package. It is incredible as a debut. It's all that you could have asked for in all these different ways. I do wonder, you know, you look, it was from the start that she was efficient. It wasn't like you saw any sort of um, offensive room for growth from that perspective. What were some of the ways that you saw her game develop between games one and game 40, you know, either on the offensive end or, you know, even defensively, where it just seemed like early on she really grasped what Christy Sides was preaching? Well, don't forget, and I didn't mention this, she has a very high basketball IQ. She really understands the game. And so that in itself helps her grow, you know, from game one uh, to game 40. And I think initially teams did not double deem her. I don't think, I think they underestimated uh, what she would be able to do as a rookie. And, you know, she went up against the best bigs in our league um, and was successful early on. And so then the next thing you know, she is getting double teamed and she is getting triple teamed and she adapted to that. And so I think her adaptability, her ability to adjust to whatever is thrown at her uh, was another thing that surprised all of us. Um, I, I think she weathered the physicality of the game. I mean, she's going to get hit up and down the floor on both ends of the floor. It's very physical in the WNBA. I think the WNBA is more physical than the NBA. No doubt in my mind about that. And, and I thought she, she handled that well. Uh, which, again, for a rookie is, is surprising. And so just to seeing her adapt to whatever happened to her, whatever took place, whatever defensive scheme she got um, w was very uh, amazing. Won't even be 22 until December. Just an incredible future for Leah Boston. And, again, you could see it as a freshman at South Carolina. She was able to display a lot of what she has subsequently been able to do. But – my goodness, just so encouraging. I just, just sort of kind of leave it with Aaliyah before we go on because there's plenty of players to talk about here. She got about 10 shots a game. Are you hoping in year two that she gets more touches? You know, obviously with a big, it's so dependent on who gets the ball, how often. I just wonder, you know, is that a level you want to see shift at all? I think we'll continue to see her get additional shots. What I love to see her do is her continue to – uh, improve how she and, uh, and Melissa played together. You know, that's always an adjustment. Okay, now you're playing with a new big uh, that you haven't played with before. And, and Melissa's deciding where her spots are and Aaliyah's deciding where her spots are. And those two uh, b becoming um, uh, able to play well together. And we saw that grow towards the end of the season. I, I, we were real pleased to see both of them on the inside, both of them on the outside, both of their abilities, uh, you, you know, to, to make each other better. And so I loved seeing that piece. When you think about what this team can be, it obviously is so dependent on the two of them together. So specifically to Melissa Smith and seeing her get back how important was that to just not only see a recovery, to see her out on the floor in and of herself, but to be able to see what the two of them can do together uh, down the stretch for you guys? Well, Howard, I think in order to be a legitimate, consistent playoff team, you've got to have a big three. And so we've got a Melissa, we've got Boston, and they're learning to play together and play off of each other. And then we've got Kelsey Mitchell in the middle. So now we've got this um, exceptional player on the perimeter and the three of them together learning how to play with each other, how to complement each other, how to make each other better is all part of our growth. And I think we saw that, you know, now, now Kelsey's got um, some, some bigs that she can play through and they can create even better shots from her. She doesn't have to create her own shots like she used to have to, to do because once the bigs touch the ball, uh, then they can kick it back out to her and she's getting some shots that she hadn't gotten in the past. And so I'm loving watching the development of, the, of that big three for us. The offensive rating of those three in a lineup together, 106.2. Uh, it, it's, you know, an elite 
group of three already that we're seeing. So we're going to get into some more, Melissa. Uh, we definitely got to talk Grace Berger uh, for sure and a number of other players uh, in segment two. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you guys at home about Jace Medical. Jace Medical is a really interesting concept. There's something called the Jace case, all right? It gives you five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. How do you get it? You fill out a simple online form. Sometimes you jump on a quick call with one of your board certified physicians. We've all been in that scenario where, geez, there's something simple, but you can't get the doctor right away when you need to. But you're able to get not just that one call, but ongoing care from physicians at Jace Medical, any treatment related questions, this was doctor created and doctor recommended. This is something that allows us to fill some holes that in, exist currently in the healthcare industry. So you can save over $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics, but you can get even more from Jace Medical by using the code Locked On at checkout at jacemedical.com. Again, it's code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, and it's J-A-S-E M-E-D-I-C-A-L dot com. Make sure you're using this doctor approved opportunity to make things easier. So back in segment two, and before we jump off into this, Smith, because it's so important to me, what do you think? If Liz had played the full year do you think she gets most improved player award? And should she have been, she was in my, in my thought, in my conversation when I talked to people about it, it was just missing that time where I said, all right, I'm going to go to the full two and play the full season. But I, I boy, if, if she's played in the full 40, I think she's got to be the choice, right? I think she would definitely be in the conversation, you know, and I, she'd certainly have my vote. Um, I think we saw her grow this season. She came in in better shape and more fit, uh, better, stronger. You know, she had an exceptional AU uh, experience where, you know, I think she ended the season the MVP and scored 50 points. And so um, it was just all part of her growth. But, you know, she, did, she didn't she uh, did be in a situation where she got to finish the whole season. She had to sit out. We had to take care of that foot. Um, and, you know, we're still uh, going to make sure here in the off season that that foot gets completely healed. Uh, she may or may not go overseas, depending on how that foot goes. It's much better. Uh, but we want it to be totally healed because we don't want to have any setbacks for her because we feel like she is a future uh, star in this league. Yeah. And you especially saw it healthy down the stretch. Uh, one of the biggest things for me about her as a modern four in this league is the fact that she's able to shoot from anywhere. So the fact that she shot almost 53% from three over the final seven games seemed to me one of the leading indicators of sort of where she's going, but you've seen pretty definitively, but, and, and Aaliyah can stretch the floor too as needed. These are both the modern bids that you're looking for. Would, would, is that modern, how you see it? Just like in the NBA, the WNBA, the, our modern bigs will be players that are versatile. You know, they can face up, you know, they can put the ball on the floor, they can post up. Um, and I, I think uh, they can move, we can move them around. Melissa's in the corner. Now she's up at the top. Same with Aaliyah. Um, right. That was another piece of Aaliyah's game that we didn't realize her versatility with her face-up game. But I think we've seen that now. And so uh, having two players uh, with their size and their strength and their skills to be able to do that, and they're both so young, uh, is really a positive for us as, in the future. No doubt about it. A year of Nikki Collin went a long way, as, as it so often does. <laughs> The, the other young players I want to make sure we're touching on, two really, and to start with Grace Berger, who just, what A, was on my old rookie team, B, was better and better as the season went along. I know she can occupy a lot of different roles. After having her for a full year, what does Grace's arc of development look like in your mind? What can she be and where should she be in this league? Well, I, you know, I've, I've been a Grace Berger fan for a long time because I followed IU closely. I've been to a lot of their games. And um, I, there, Grace Berger always caught my attention uh, whenever I watched IU play because of her versatility. You know, at, at this level, you need to be able to play more than one position. And not only can Grace play uh, more than one position, she can play three positions. She can play the point, uh, the shooting guard, and uh, the, uh, the small forward. And she's six foot tall, 
and she's um, um, very strong for, for a rookie. And so I always had her um, in my mix. I was concerned that she would be gone by seven, you know, that we wouldn't have the opportunity to take her uh, because she would, you know, go at five or six. Mm -hmm. um, but I also knew that, that Christy and I um, had talked about the fact that we didn't want to overwhelm her too soon. And I thought Christy did a really great job of bringing her in slow, giving her some minutes, giving her a few minutes, and then continuing to extend those minutes with some play at the two, some play at the three. Um, and, and then she started to zoom in on letting her be the backup point guard to Erica Wheeler. And she got more and more minutes, more and more comfortable. Um, and so I thought they did, the coaching staff did a really good job of letting her grow uh, in her rookie season, in particular as a point guard. To me, and, and it's interesting you say it that way, the fact that we saw her turnover percentage come down considerably over the final part of the season during the time that she was getting more opportunities to lead the team as a point guard. I, I mean, I know having that versatility matters a great deal in this league. Do you see her potential ceiling as a starting point guard in this league? Well, I, yes, I do. And I think, Harold, you and I talked before, you know, and I used the analogy. She reminds me of, of, a, of a Lindsay Whalen type player. And I remember when Lindsay came into the league, you know, I'm saying um, uh, nobody really thought that she would end up with four rings and four championships and, 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 and be the point guard for our Olympic team. But there's something about the way Grace plays, her strength, her physicality, her passing ability, her unselfishness, her high basketball IQ uh, that reminds me of Lindsay. So I think she has, I think she has that potential. We know her work ethic is off the charts. We know her basketball IQ is extremely high. Uh, and, and, and then we've seen her versatility. And then lo and behold, she leads the whole rookie class in three-point shooting because she came early and she stayed late and she worked on that part of her game because I think she got tired of, of people saying, well, she can't hit the three. Yes, she can. She and can. she's always had a great mid-range game and she's strong and physical and she can get to the rim. I think next year we need to post her up more. When she's playing the point, she needs to take that little point that's on her down and just post her up because she's really good at that too. When, when I saw her in person, now, the evident work she had put in the weight room, she's gotten bigger and stronger to go along with it. But just to your point, the final 12 games, I know it's a small sample, but when you're dealing with rookies, you got to look and see where is that progress coming for her to be, you know, two to one assist to turnover percentage. And she shot 47.4% from three. I mean, you know, to me, when you talk about that kind of prototype, uh, it, with all due respect to Lindsay Well, and one of the greats in the history of this league, she was never that kind of three-point shooter as well. So, uh, you know, and it's all the more necessary, obviously, in the modern WNBA game as well, even though I think Lindsay would get mad at me for contrasting the modern game with when she played. So <laughs> apologies to Lindsay Whalen. But as we think about those who can stretch the floor, and, and you know, we haven't talked about Kelsey Mitchell, who – was on my all WNBA second team, who was somebody who I think it's easy to overlook because she has been so consistent since coming into the league, but she strikes me as clearer than ever somebody who can be a number one option on a championship team. And I say that because to me, you know, you kind of go back and, you know, we've had these conversations where you say, all right, is Jewel Lloyd going to be somebody who can be a point guard? Is she going to be a shooting guard? Is she going to be something like a lead guard, a combo guard, a, you know, like a Katie Smith type? And that question kind of loomed over her from the time she was drafted in 2015, right up through this year when suddenly Seattle needed her to be that uh, after losing Sue Bird and Brianna Stewart. And it's sort of a similar question with Kelsey Mitchell, you know, the almost having too many top level skills to figure out where is it going to fill out? Do you feel like that we have a full picture now of what Kelsey Mitchell is and can be for this team? I think we've seen Kelsey Mitchell's growth over the last year uh, be very impressive. You know, she used to be one dimensional when it came to her left hand. Now she can use either hand. Um, she can get to the rim. You know, she's got that pull-up jumper. She's got always had a three. Um, she's become a better passer. So I think we've seen her grow her game, and now she has better players to play with. 
You know, she doesn't have to carry the burden of I've got to score 30 or we can't win. You know, you can score 20 and shoot 50 percent and we can win. Mm -hmm. And so I think she's learning how to play with better people. And I'm, I love seeing that progress for her. Uh, if there's a quicker two guard in the WNBA, I don't know who it is because she has a fit speed um, that nobody else has. And so I have her in my top five two guards in this league. I mean, she may be top three. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Jewel Lloyd fan. I'm a, I'm a um, Jackie Young or Plum, whoever, or Rike. But let me tell you something. Kelsey Mitchell is in that group. No doubt about it. And and my goodness, that that's the quickness, which has always been there, is one thing. But you can see the work she has put in, in terms of the skills and drilling down into it really is a lot of fun. Be right back uh, to talk a little bit about the offseason, a very different, unconventional offseason right here. Uh, but first... I want to talk to you guys at home about FanDuel. And FanDuel has a couple of... Uh, it's called the NFL, the National Football League. Um, not too familiar with it, but apparently uh, it's been around for some time. And there's a gap, women's basketball fans, between October 20th is the latest the WNBA season can be, game five. Um, and then the collegiate season starts first week in November. So you got about two weeks, right, where you got to fill between women's basketball. We all feel that. All right, fine, take in an NFL game or two. During that time, and FanDuel will help you do it. If you bet $5 as a new customer, you get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 can get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. That's like WNBA League Pass, but for the National Football League, apparently. So now is the best time to join FanDuel. You go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So that's a good time to watch the NFL, right? And that, that like two week gap between women's basketball, does that sound right to you? That might be. <laughs> so let's talk about after that gap, right? When we get into November and we get into, I, I think it's fair to say it's going to be a college season unlike any other, right? So how do you navigate it? You know, we won't even get into the free agent part of things uh, first. We'll talk first about just the idea that, you know, there's so many players who are going to be in this draft and be in this lottery if they come, but they're going to have that choice. So, you know, is it having those conversations? Is it trying to find out, like, like what do you do as a general manager to kind of navigate what your list ought to look like? It's all about preparation. You're prepared for whatever might happen. It's just like game preparation for when you're playing an opponent. Are we prepared to be trapped? Are we prepared to be switched? Are we prepared, you know, for a zone defense? Uh, so we prepare as if all of the top players will come out. We prepare as if none of them come out. And so we know that we are going to get two of the top 15 players, whoever they may be, two of them are coming to the Indiana Fever. Right. So we had to zoom in on um, a, a, a pool uh, that covers the potential players that we could that we could select. We have to watch them practice. We have to watch them play, film and in person. Uh, we have to talk to the people that they work with. We have to find out what type of person they are on the court and off the court. So we have to do a lot of research. But at the end of the day, we have to be prepared. Uh, for whatever might take place. Uh, if Caitlin Clark comes out and we're prepared and we know all about her, great. If she doesn't, then who did come out? Who is coming out? And are, have we done our homework on that particular player or players? Is it easier to get to more games after next year? You know, there's all this realignment. You know, I, a large part of me is very sad about it. You see something like the Pac-12 disappear and that's something that you know has obviously a huge women's basketball legacy but just functionally you know i even think about it from a journalist perspective you know uh, oregon comes to the big 10 and so they're going to come to rutgers i'm in new jersey and i'm able to see them i just wonder like does it get easier as a general manager after next year because there are going to be a bunch of these truly national conferences 
Well, it may get it maybe get easier for us here with Indiana Fever because we're sitting in the heart of the Big Ten Conference and we're in the middle of America, you know, so we're we're easily able to travel. We're not on the East Coast, we're not on the West Coast, we're right here in the Central. And so we can, in essence, get to places easier. I think the real key thing, Howard, is the high visibility now of the women's college game. Mm -hmm. I can find a women's college game, two or three maybe, every night. And I love what these conferences have done. I love that what they've done with CBS, uh, ABC, NBC, ESPN, Big Ten Game of the Week, ACC Game of the Week. Um, so I, I, I'm just thrilled that there's so much more visibility. I can watch a lot of games um, and stay home. I can watch four games, you know, every night if I need to. Uh, but, but that's good, and that's going to help me with evaluation. But I've got to go and watch them practice. I've got to see what they're doing in practice. I've got to see how they interact with their teammates. So I've got to do, be able to do both. Yeah, the Big Ten Network alone has been a game changer as far as that goes. So the fact that that happens to be a conference that is growing, I think, is good for the women's game as well. I, I do wonder, though, and, and this is, again, a quirk of the schedule of women's basketball, which is that you're going to have to make some free agent decisions as you don't know who's coming out you know, for whatever your draft pick is. And we'll get to in a second, you know, how you make sure that you get the number one pick again, because obviously that's yeah. a very helpful thing. Um, but, you know, just how do you navigate that with contingency plans? Because it really could, the draft, the draft and the value of a draft pick, even when you get number one, is going to vary so significantly based on who's coming out and, and also what position they play. Right. Well, I think you've got to cover all your bases by making sure you keep your core. And, and, and I, when I say the term core, I'm talking seven or eight players that you know you're going to keep on your team. And this is who you're building around, not only today, but tomorrow and in the future. You know, you've got to have that strong core. And so we're going to keep them in place, whatever it might take, contract extensions, whatever. And then we're looking at the free agents that would complement uh, that core that we have. And, and, and the draft picks that would. But that keeping that core signed, sealed, and delivered uh, is another part of our job, deciding who is that core and how we keep them and how they get better. So interesting. So in that way, when that's what you have centered in your mind, the rest of it can balance with no matter what, whether it's a draft pick, whether it's a free agent. No matter, right. makes it's a lot of sense. With inside players, outside players, leadership, high basketball IQ, babies versus veterans. Uh, it's like a recipe. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Well, the recipe that's coming together, obviously um, looking tasty to be sure as you head into <laughs> year three. But I do wonder, you know, last year, as, as you know, it was the first time Indiana ever had the number one overall pick, you know, the ping pong balls went your way. What superstitions are you taking forward into this year's draft lottery to make sure that happens again? Well, Howard, first of all, we've positioned ourselves in a perfect spot to get the number one pick again. You know, even though we won eight more games, right. uh, even though we fought for that uh, last playoff spot, we're still in a position um, to have 44% of the balls based on it being a two-year um, uh, deal when it comes to the to the lottery. So, so we've We've gotten better. We've improved. We've been competitive. We've beaten teams. You know, we beat Washington. We beat Dallas. We beat Minnesota. We beat Chicago. Uh, you know, we, we've had some great wins this year, but yet we're still positioned where we want it to be if we didn't get in the playoffs to get that first pick. And so now all we have to do is make sure that the league lets the balls fall like they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And that's the most balls wins. <laughs> So you're just putting your faith in math. You're not going to have like a lucky charm or anything you bring along. Well, I'm going to put my faith in both. I'm going to have my lucky charm and I'm going to have my math and I'm going to expect us to get the first pick. Understood. Well, that seems like you're covering all your bases. I love that. It makes sense. Well, listen, Lyndon, it is always great to chat with you. I sure appreciate your time. Uh, I know women's basketball fans do as well. How, um, how open, how honest you are, and how accessible you are to all of us so we can tell that story. So 
it is appreciated. And to our audience at home, thank you as always. Uh, stay tuned tomorrow where the great Jackie Powell will take you on home and into the weekend talking about the Mystics and the Liberty with Jen Hatfield, uh, both of whom cover those teams with distinction for us over at the Nets. So until then, I am Howard Megdahl wishing all of you a wonderful Thursday. Ogumba Wallet. Thank you, Howard. For the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. 